Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Pebble Creek, Pebble Creek Community Church. We are so grateful that God has given us this special day to praise and honor him in song and by the reading and preaching of his holy word. All praise and honor to our God. We would like to extend a special greeting to all who are visiting with us today. If you would like to learn more about our church, please check out the visitor center in the back and pick up a welcome packet. Complete information sheet if you uh, would like to be on our email distribution list. Once you're on the list, you'll receive notifications of all upcoming events. <clears throat> we would like to say hello to all who are visiting us on the web. If you ever in the area would love to have you visit us. The Know Your Bible topic for this month is Solomon's Ecclesiastics, and it's available on our website. Today, we are celebrating the Lord's table. The communion elements are on the table where you entered. If you need them, please raise your hands and an usher will give one to you. Don't see any hands. Okay. Normally, we do that at the end of the service. So. <laughs> Um, if you need prayer, we are here for you. We have a dedicated team of prayer partners who will lift your requests to the Lord. Please review the bulletin for ways to submit your prayer requests. We welcome a familiar face, Pastor Dennis Kazar, who will be blessing us, <laughs> blessing us for the next two weeks in his word and wisdom. Giving back to the Lord a portion of what he has so graciously given us is very special to believers. Members and regular attenders may do so by depositing your gifts in the offering box near the entry or visit the website for more giving options. Visitors, there's no obligation for you to give. We are just grateful to have you as our guests. If you'd like to provide treats for our fellowship time following the service, it is easier than ever. Simply go to the fellowship table, sign up. There's a sign up booklet there. And get this, you don't even have to bake. The HOA is still requiring all served snacks to be store bought. So please help out by signing up today. Today, we are having to bid farewell to our music director, Emmy Busby. Our time with Emmy has been too short but she is excited about an opportunity to teach music to elementary age children. It will give her an opportunity for full-time employment with access to retirement plans. We will definitely miss Emmy's beautiful soprano voice and her musical talents. Can you all have my phone number, please call me. <laughs> <laughs> we wish God's blessing to Emmy and her husband David as they move into the next steps for their lives. And now, let us invite his holy presence into our hearts, and this service as surely plays our prelude, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
wish Shirley was in 3D. She's not, clearly. Um, but we so appreciate her taking time to make us recordings for today's service. Will you please stand for our opening hymn, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence? Here's how this is going to work. This is a hymn from the St. James Liturgy of the Greek Orthodox Church. It's a beautiful hymn. I'm going to sing the first verse by myself so you can hear how it goes once. And then if you get lost, the choir knows it. So listen for them and I'll, I'll show you when to sing with me. Okay, we're good. it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. You may be seated. What can I say? <laughs> Here we are, by the grace of God. Kind of emotional for me. So if I get a little emotional, you'll understand. I'm 
just looking. I love you guys. I love this church. I love what God's going to do in and through this church. But there's an if. We'll talk about that this morning. Joan sends her greetings to those of you that know her. People ask me, how's she doing? As Jim Reynolds said at our farewell, she's Miss Lovely. She's doing great. She's praying for us this morning. She sends greetings to all of you. She is uh, my rock. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, I come to you this morning in the strong name of Jesus. So grateful, Lord, that you have invited us to come boldly before your throne of grace to find help in time of need. And we acknowledge to you, Lord, that we're a needy people. We're a needy church. We need you every moment of every day. And so grateful that you're available to us 24-7. You want us to come to you. So we do this morning, Father, we come to you with thankful hearts, thankful that you're our God, Thankful that you're God omnipotent who reigns forever and ever. And we thank you, Father, that you not only have the whole world in your hands, but you have each of us in your hands. And you'll never let us go. And I pray this morning as we continue in our worship service, Father, that we would sense your presence. Give us that ability to set things aside things that we've come from, things that are going to be going to after the service. And in these moments together, just be lost in a sense of your presence. Give us that ability to bring every thought and every imagination into captivity to Christ. To come to you, Father, with hearts that are open, that ears that are open, that we might hear that still small voice of your spirit speaking to us, Father, in a way that only you can. You know our needs. You know our cares and concerns. So thankful, Lord, that we can cast them all upon you this morning. And we do pray, Father, for those that are unable to be with us, those that are traveling, those that are still with family, that you would also minister to them as you only can. And for those that have physical needs today, too, Father, we would remember them. You're the God of all comfort. And I pray that you would comfort and encourage them today, Father, wherever they are, whatever they're going through. We pray for our country. It's so divided, Lord. And we know that we need that revival, and we know it begins with us. So again, we just trust you, Father, to do what only you can do. And we want to be your obedient servants. We want to make ourselves available to you today. And we're thankful that we have this privilege of being together this morning. And we do commit our time to you, Father, in the strong, powerful name of Christ the Lord. Amen. Yeah. 
think God alone can see. Unrevealed until it's season, nothing can think God alone. Something God alone, something God alone. That was beautiful. If you have your Bibles today, would you turn with me to Psalm 133? It'll be up on the screen, I believe. It's a great psalm. It's called One of the Songs of Ascents. There are 15 psalms from Psalm 120 through 134 that are songs that the children of Israel would sing as they were ascending up to Mount Zion going to the holy city to worship God and to experience the festivals that they had at that time. So on their trek up the mountain, up Mount Zion, headed in, they would sing. They would sing to each other, just break out with song. And there are 15 of them. They would sing them over and over again every year as they made that trek. One of the Psalms, Psalm 133, is one of the shortest it is. There's only one other with three verses. That's Psalm 131. But it's short, so it's easy just to go quickly through it. And that's that. No, no. It's short, but it's powerful. There's a message for us. A message that the Spirit of God wants to deliver to all of our hearts today. It's a crucial message. Not because I'm preaching it, but because the word of God underscores it time and time again. I had my first encounter with what the psalm is talking about in my first pastorate. I was 24 years old, my second year of seminary up in Portland, Oregon, and I was asked to pastor this little church part-time. Full-time work, part-time pay. That's the way it was. But anyway, uh, a small little church. They were meeting in an abandoned winery. Had great communion services, by the way. But it was uh, this abandoned winery. Big wine vats still there. They did some remodeling. And there I was, the first time being a pastor. Watch out. In a little town... There are probably only two people in here have ever heard of. Keith and Leota have heard of. Carver, Oregon, right? Anyone else know where Carver, Oregon is? No. You haven't missed a whole lot. But it's, it's a little town on the Estacada Highway. Beautiful little town. Uh, and this church was right downtown. And I went there with a goal. I was going to see God evangelize that town. We were going to see people come to know Christ. We were going to have to build a new building probably in the first year to contain that. Was I mistaken? Well, I found out that the Sunday before I got there, the deacons on Monday morning, previous Monday morning, after the preacher had preached, three deacons showed up at his door and fired him. Well, that wasn't the first time it happened in that church. He was the third pastor that had been fired. I'm going to leave that story there for a moment. But I thought, well, you know, that's the way it goes. I'll move on. And, uh, I began to go around the town, and I decided I'm going to visit every home in this little town. And I would knock on the door, and I would say, I'm the new pastor at Carver Community Church. Oh, we know about that church. Boom. 
I never got into one home in that entire community. I'm a little slow, so I kept going. But somebody's going to let me in. No, none, no one. Talk about discouragement. But I'm a bit of a hardhead. Every Monday morning, I had no classes. I'd get my little Volkswagen bug, and I'd go to another house. Same story. How sad. But you come to a psalm like this. It's just how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Let me just stop there. You've got to unpack that, that one verse. How good and pleasant. You know, there are some things that are good for us, but they're not pleasant. You remember castor oil? They said it was good for you, but it wasn't pleasant. There are some things that are pleasant, but they're not good for you. They cater to the flesh. But he said, oh, when brothers dwell together in unity, it's good and it's pleasant. It just feels right. It's good as far as you're concerned, certainly as far as God is concerned, and it's pleasant because there's a, there's a feeling and an aroma about the body of Christ being together, loving each other, praising God together as one body. And, and you know if you have children, have had children, you know how good and pleasant it is when those kids get along. They love each other. They want to be with each other. They hug each other. They support each other. They go through the tough times together, but they're right there. You also know when the kids aren't getting along, it's not good. It's not pleasant. The whole atmosphere changes in the home until things get right again. And that's the way it is with church. You know, I've been in churches, and you have too, where there's a feeling. Some churches you walk into, there's a feeling, all right, but it ain't good. Got kind of icy, got kind of stiff. We go through the motions, we're very perfunctory, and we do what we need to do, and we go through the motions, but there's no life there. Now watch this. Good and pleasant is when brothers, who are their brothers? Brothers and sisters, believe me. When brothers and sisters, in other words, with those that are of the same, in the same family. And if you're a Christian today, you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You are in the family of God. He's adopted you into his family. You're a child of the living God. And every other believer is your brother and sister in Christ. That's it. You can't get out of it. <laughs> You're there. You're the family of God. And a local church is an expression of the body of Christ, of the family of God. And the brothers and sisters are the ones that you, you count on. But he goes on to say, when they live together, when they dwell together in unity, Brothers and sisters, just living together, dwelling together, accepting each other with all of our idiosyncrasies and craziness and, and uh, foibles. We accept one another even as God, for Christ's sake, accepted us. We're in the family. And we're committed to each other. Now that, that all sounds nice, doesn't it? I read that first verse and I say, my goodness. What a model, perfect model, but it's not easy. I know it's not easy. I've been around long enough and I've pastored enough churches to know it's not easy. There are times when we really annoy each other, we get upset with each other, and somebody said it's kind of like a, like a group of porcupines on a cold night, we gather together, for warmth and coziness, and then we start barbering each other, and we go. And then we come back together, and it's not long until we're barbering each other again. So it's not easy, and I don't mean to pretend that it is, but when, here's the question. When you don't have 
unity. Where the church is not, according to uh, verse 1, pleasant, good, wonderful, living together, celebrating the goodness of God together. What do you do? What do you do? Do you leave? Do you gripe, complain? Do you gossip? Do you trash people? What, what do you do? You stop. You pause. Back to Carver. Carver Community Church. They said, I, went, I made the rounds, for sure. But finally, I got it through my head. We're never going to have a ministry in this community as disunited as we are. What had happened, the pastor resigned, yes, but he stayed in town. Not only did he stay in town, he started another church up the hill in the Grange Hall. The people that lived in the town followed him. And they went up the hill on Sunday morning to church. The people that lived on the hill came down to the town to go to church. Two-lane road. They weren't speaking to each other. I always wondered if they're going to run somebody off the road. There's going to be an accident. What's going to happen? No, we're going to worship God. Up the hill, down the hill. Same time services, but no communication between the two. Great testimony in the community. So I said, now let's stop. Let's stop. The Spirit of God is not at work here. We've got a problem. Problem of unity. I met with the pastor. I said, there's an obstacle here. He said, oh, I know, I know it. <laughs> he was bitter and angry himself. And I said, the Spirit of God is grieved. He's quenched. He's not able to flow. We've got to deal with that. You see what happens is the Spirit of God indwells every believer and wants to empower every believer and wants to help us counteract our flesh, our negative tendencies. But when we, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.19, there are times we quench the Spirit of God. Or as NIV says, we put out the fire of the Spirit. We adapt, adapt it down. How do you quench the Spirit? Well, you quench the Spirit when you say no. Spirit prompts you to do something, to write a note to make a phone call, to reach out to someone, to make things right with someone. And, you know, we're very good at rationalizing. And so we say, yeah, yeah, I probably should, but, and we don't do it. And we know things aren't right. And uh, we procrastinate, or we say no. And what does that do? It quenches the Spirit of God. Instead of him being free to flow, he now has to turn his ministry into you and to me to get us to do the right thing. And then it says, don't grieve the Spirit of God. How do you grieve the Spirit of God? Well, the Spirit of God is, is a person, not just an influence, not just the Holy Ghost. He's a Spirit. It's a person, and he has feelings, and he has emotions, and he is God. And you grieve the Spirit of God when you say yes. Yes to sin. Yes to gossip. Yes to slander. Yes to trashing somebody. That's saying, yes, I'll do what I want to do. That's what my flesh wants to do. Oh, believe me, I've had times. You know, I was 
a while back, well, quite a while back, give me a break, quite a while back, I was in an airport. Nobody was in line. To, well, I was getting a rental car, actually. And I went up to the counter, and here's this guy standing, supposed to be helping me. He's on a phone, chatting away to his girlfriend. I'm in a hurry. I waited. I said, hey, uh, I need your help. Uh, I'll be with you pretty soon. Keeps on chatting. Well, my flesh, I was about ready to come over the counter and help him. But, uh, you know, that and stuff, that attitude of uh, saying yes to my flesh. I didn't say yes. But there are times. And I was raised in Oakland, California, and we had to fight our way through things. And my dad was a boxer, so uh, that is kind of something that came natural for me. But that is one illustration. You have your own. There are times when you say, yes, I'm gonna, I know it's not right, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I feel like it. Make me feel good to tell that person off to do this or that. That quenches the spirit. Listen to the context of that now, of that command. And these are commands. Quench not, grieve not. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. How's that for starters? But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed unto the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all anger, brawling, slander, with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ in God has forgiven you. Now, come with me. Stay with me. Psalm 133. This is what you could jump over, but don't do it. When brothers live together in unity, what, what happens? It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down to the collar of his robes, down to the actual hem of his robes. What's all that about? That's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You can see it in the Psalms, in the book of Isaiah. We won't turn to the passages. But oil is a symbol. It wasn't just the kind of oil we think of. It was special oil. It was a blend of spices, cinnamon, myrrh, all kinds of spices. And it had an aroma about it. And it said that when this happens, this is what it's like. When there's that unity, when the spirit is not grieved, he's not quenched, he's flowing. He said it's like oil flowing down. And that oil that they use throws off an aroma. And that becomes, as John Piper said, the perfume of the church. I like that. The perfume of the church. There's an aroma. There's something here. I, I sense it. I feel it. I'm attracted to it. You know when there's a good aroma, you're attracted to it, right? When there's a bad aroma, you stay away. And I have to say, churches in general, I'm generalizing, a lot of times there's not a good aroma, there's a bad aroma, not a good smell. Somebody said, I like what one person said, I said, you know, Sometimes churches are like Noah's Ark. I said, how's that? They said, well, if it weren't for the storm outside, you couldn't stand the smell inside. <laughs> I think there's some truth to that, you know. And yet, when the spirit is not quenched, he's not grieved, he's flowing, that oil is pervasive, it flows, you can't contain it, it goes all the way down. 
and it covers everything, and it gives off that beautiful aroma, and people are attracted to it. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen here. I've seen it happen other places. Here's another picture he gives. It is like, it's like oil, but now they're singing away. And it's like dew of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon was the highest peak in that part of the world, that part of uh, Israel. And uh, it was about 9,000 feet high. And so they were saying dew is like, uh, unity is like the dew that's on Mount Hermon. Well, dew is another symbol for the Holy Spirit. The book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 3, and also in the Psalms. And what does dew do? What does dew do? <laughs> it's refreshing. It's nourishing. It also uh, runs down, doesn't it? As it melts off and it nourishes. And he said, that's what unity is like. And he said, it's a, a powerful, power thing. Because when the Spirit is working like that, the Spirit unites, the flesh divides. And mark that down. The Spirit unites people. Listen to this verse from Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 3. Make it your aim. This is out of Philip's translation, which I really like. Make it your aim to be at one in the Spirit, and you will inevitably be at peace with one another. Ephesians 4.3, J.B. Phillips' translation. Powerful, powerful. You will inevitably be at peace when you're one in the Spirit and realize that. The same Spirit that indwells me and dwells you and makes us brothers and one in Christ. So both dew and oil descend from above. They come from God. But they don't come just haphazardly from God. They come from God when we get our hearts right. And we're not grieving, we're not quenching the spirit. Then we're in a position for God's spirit to flow again. <laughs> And when he flows and obstacles are removed and the drain is unclogged, it's just such a beautiful, powerful thing. I, I, I have seen it. There's nothing I, I love better than watching that uh, happen. But what is not, the, spirit, the flesh divides always. Now, what happens when we're experiencing that flow. Here's what happens. Three things. And they're, they're here in the text. The first one, we've seen it somewhat in the, in the verse. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard. And it's like the dew of Mount Hermon. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is released to work. And... That's what you want in a church. It's not by power, it's not by might, it's not by our cleverness, but it's by the spirit that anything happens. Zechariah 4, 6. The spirit. But what happens? He's released, he's free. He's not free to work when there's division and disunity in the church. And you begin to see that, that the spirit is released and he does what only he can do, and it's beautiful. But when there's no anointing of oil, and when there's no dew, there's not going to be any unity in the body. So the second thing that happens is believers, Christians, are revitalized. They come alive. They come alive by the Spirit. And there's a a new joy and a new peace and the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness, it just comes because there's a revitalization of believers. We don't just plod in to church and do our own thing and leave and same way we came in. No. You you're come alive in the Spirit. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. 
But here's the biggest one. Stay with me. All that sounds good. And it's not easy. And I repeat that. And it takes a commitment on every single individual. The claims are a part of the body. And I like what someone put it this way. Oh, to dwell above with the saints we love. Oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know, well, that's another story. And that's right. It is. But the Spirit of God can put us together. Okay. Here's the last phrase. If this is the kicker. <laughs> For there, where? Where? There, where our church is united, and where the Spirit is released, and where believers are being revitalized, what happens? There, circle that. For there the Lord bestows his blessing. The picture I get in my mind is God in heaven is looking at the millions, thousands of local churches across the land. And he's trying to find one. And when he finds one that is united and walking in the Spirit, God says, oh, there I command my blessing. There the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Life for those that are not believers. Why? Because they are attracted now. And they're impacted. My, how these Christians love each other. And you know that word gets around. What joy they have. I've got to see what's going on there. I've had guys come in. I said, how did you have to come to our church? I had to see what was going on here. I talked to some of your people. We were excited. I saw all the cars. I had to see. And they were attracted and impacted by the unity of the body. Hang on. Jesus, on the upper room discourse, just prior to going back to the Father, had a little group of believers with him. And he said many precious things to them. But here's one that just rocks me. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. Forget about the old ones for now. I'm giving you not a suggestion. I'm giving you a commandment, a new one. Get a hold of this one. New commandment, that you love one another even as I have loved you. And here's the thing. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. You ponder that, which I have. And it was Francis Schaeffer who said this about, about that verse. He said, think about this. He said, God gives the unbelieving world the privilege to judge us based on our observable love to one another. That's powerful. Jesus says, do it. He also mentions, as you go on, and then his last prayer, as Jesus was, was just totally ending up, ready to go to the cross. He prays. Listen to this. My prayer, Jesus' prayer, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. I pray that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I'm in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. That's powerful stuff. And we talk about reaching our community for Christ. Yes, that's what we're called to do. But first, we've got to get our act together. 
And when we do, then the Spirit empowers us, and then God revitalizes us by his Holy Spirit, and then God says, now you can reach out in an authentic way because the body is united. One last story on Carver. So finally, I I did talk to the pastor, and I said, we need to get our two boards together. He said, I don't know if that'll happen. I said, it's got to happen. So he finally said, I'll talk to my board, and finally they agreed to meet. And I'll never forget that night, 60-some years ago. I came in stiff, uptight. His board sat on this side of the table. Board of my church sat on this side of the table. The tension was palpable. You could feel it. I don't know if any of you have been up to the DMZ zone. I have. North Korea, South Korea. And I've seen the table up there. I've stood there. North Korea on this side, South Korea here. They're just ready for somebody to make a false move. <laughs> like kids when we're going to have a fight, you know, who's going to throw the first punch? But reading scripture, praying, I sensed the Spirit descending. And he did. And it was a glorious time. Ended up with hugs, apologies. Got together as one church and celebrated. To my knowledge, to this day, they're together making an impact on the community. And I've seen it go the other way. And I've been down that road more times than I like to think. But I know what God can do. And Paul Billheimer makes this statement. He said, the continuous and widespread fragmentation of the church has been the scandal of the ages. It's been Satan's master strategy. The sin of disunity is probably has caused more souls to be lost than all other sins combined. I, I can't argue with it. But it doesn't have to be that way. And I don't know all that you're going through, and I, I really don't care about all he said, she said, they did. You know, you can go down that road. And I don't, I don't care that much about that. What I do care about is that each individual does what Jesus said. Remove the log out of your own eye before you try to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. But each of us just deal with God. My attitude, where I'm at, Yes, I'm hurting, I'm confused, I don't understand what's happening. And the people have t- said to me already this morning, I don't know what happened. You know, what, what happened? I heard this, I heard that, I heard something else. And there's confusion. Satan loves that. <laughs> he fans that flame. The more confused we are, the better as far as he's concerned because we're not affected. So I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus Christ. You've never said, God, I'm a sinner. I'm so thankful that Jesus died for all my sins. And I receive him as my Savior. I want to be your child. I want to be a part of your forever family. And if you don't have absolute assurance that you've done that and that you're a child of the living God, today is the day. Don't wait. Eternity is real. I know most of you are believers. You have to ask yourself, have I grieved the Spirit of God? Have I quenched the Spirit of God? Have I kind of put out the fire of the Spirit? You know, it's not that hard. It is one sense because we're stubborn. But he said, if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just 
to forgive you all your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then the Spirit of God can again take control. And next week we'll talk about what that really means to have the Spirit of God taking control in your lives. But there's too much at stake. The world we live in is getting crazier by the moment. The disunity, disharmony. On you go. We've got to be different. And by God's grace, we will. You will. I know you will. I know, I know you will enough. Let's pray. God, continue to speak to us as we prepare for communion. I pray your son's name. Amen. Sorry, I thought he was going to pray longer. That's okay. Will you stay seated for our hymn of preparation when I survey the wondrous cross? business and we need to always come to the Lord's table with our hearts prepared otherwise it's a mockery we really do and if you're here as a believer today we invite you to take but to make sure your heart is right and if it's not you need you need time that's fine there's no shame there's no embarrassment by not taking communion 
There have been times I've not taken it. It's not just a ritual you go through because it's the first Sunday of the month, let's do communion and get out of here. No, 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 no. It's a lot more serious than that. And if you're not a believer, it doesn't make sense to you. Because you'll see as we partake communion, there are four things we need to do. This is not a four-point sermon, but it's things to remember as you take communion. Let me share them with you. Before I do, a couple of verses that he prefaces the Lord's Supper with these words. The following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And he says, to some extent, I believe that. And then he gives a big caution about taking communion. That's why I say it's serious. But here are the four things that we're to do. Twice, he says, you do this in remembrance of me. So it's a backward look. He's saying, when I survey the wondrous cross, that's what we feel. We look back. Jesus, the sinless, spotless Son of God, took on that human body and became sin for me. <laughs> Never get over it. He did. He died for all my sins. He said, it's finished. Do it in remembrance of me. Don't ever forget it. He loved you so much. He died for you. So there's a backward look, but look at what else. It says, for when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. But when you take that little wafer, which I don't like, but uh, you take that, and you take the cup and you hold it, you know what you're doing? You're proclaiming. You're preaching. Same word used for preaching. In the Greek language, it is. Jesus died for me. I'm a Christ follower. You proclaim. So you look outward. And you want everybody else to know that Jesus loves them and died for them too, you proclaim. Then he says, you do this until he comes. That's the upward look. You look upward. Jesus is coming again. I don't know when, but I believe with all my heart he's coming again. It could be very, very soon. Things certainly are lining up that way. I want to be ready. Must abide in him so that when he appears, you will not be ashamed at his coming. You won't shrink back. So you look up, remind yourself of the blessed hope. Then the last thing that he says, the last of the four, a man, a woman ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. We don't examine each other, we examine ourselves. And that's what we've been talking about this morning. Lord, search my heart and see if there's any offensive way in me. And give me the grace to deal with that. And then we partake. So I'm going to give you just a few minutes again, not minutes, but a few seconds, to just prepare your heart as a believer, if you're not a believer and you're here, we're delighted you're here. We encourage you not to partake of the cup because it's for believers, those that have committed their lives to Jesus Christ. We'd be glad to talk to you about what that really means in more depth if you want. But let's bow in preparation for partaking of the elements. Father, I thank you for every man and every woman that's here this morning. And you alone know our hearts. Man looks on the outward appearance, but you look at the heart. 
And we're thankful, Lord, that you do that. And we do want you to, by your spirit, to reveal to us anything, anything that's in our life that's blocking the flow of your spirit. So guide us, Father, as we ponder what your word has said today and as we partake of these elements. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you to open up your little cup. I know it takes a while, but to get that little wafer out, which is representative of the body of Jesus. Jesus, on the last night, when he was betrayed, he took bread, and Jesus says, and he broke it. He said, this is my body. This represents my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You ready? Let's all partake. And Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant of my blood. You know what that means? A new agreement. <laughs> what a covenant is. A new agreement I've made. An eternal covenant with you. And I have sealed it with my blood that I've shed for you. And he said, so as often as you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me that I shed my blood for you and I made a whole new arrangement between you and God. Let's partake. Let's stand for the benediction. Give me time to get to the back. Our closing hymn today is going to be Jesus, Joy of Our Desiring. You may know this tune. Um, it's from the Bach Brandenburg Concertos, which if you're well-versed on Bach, you know that's the da 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 It's that melody that goes over the top of it. If you've been to a wedding recently, you've probably heard this. It's when the bridesmaids come in. So I promise you'll recognize the tune when I sing it. I'm going to do it once by myself, and then we'll all just do the first verse together. Jesus, joy of our desiring, holy wisdom, love.
that our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope may he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word as you go about your way today. Go in his peace. Amen.